Um, our seminar speaker today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Travis Sawyer, who is from the Wyatt College of Optical Sciences. And my question to you is, raise your hand if you would say that what you are doing in your lab could be considered interdisciplinary. Okay, good, like half of you, that's good. So as you can tell with science, it's interdisciplinarity all the way. <laughs> I feel like there are some um, you know, aspects out there that I would say are more specifically basic sciences or medical sciences or this or that or the other, but I think there's a lot more collaboration going on and a lot more work between disciplines. And so you might be thinking, we have someone here today, our seminar speaker who's from optical sciences. That is very interesting. Um, but you're gonna learn much more about that. So Dr. Sawyer is an assistant professor in optical sciences, but he also holds joint appointments in biomedical engineering, um, electrical and computer engineering, and he's also a research assistant professor in the College of Medicine in medical imaging as well. Uh, so lots of different types of, uh, let's say, disciplines involved here. Um, Dr. Sawyer is, I would say, a true blue wildcat. So he did his bachelor's here, uh, then he went off to Cambridge, he did a master's, then came back, and did a master's, and did his PhD all here at the U of A, which is great. And if you remember to two weeks ago at your last seminar, we talked about graduate fellowships and um, nationally competitive scholarships. And Dr. Sawyer has won many awards, many of which are actually in those groups of things that I'm encouraging you to look into. So he's actually received the Goldwater Scholarship, the Astronaut Scholarship, the Churchill Scholarship, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Award, like all of those he's won. So I encourage you to look into those as well um, and apply for them and take time this summer to look into them. Um, he's also been able to travel to the UK to do research as well as Korea. And um, his research focuses on optical imaging, but in a specific, um, I would say, focus on disease. So um, he currently leads the Biomedical Optics and Optical Measurement Lab here at the U of A, um, which aims to develop new imaging technologies and methods for disease diagnosis, specifically in regard to cancer. So I'm really glad you're here today to share with us you. your research. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, quite possibly one of the best introductions I've ever had. Uh, but yeah, let's see. Get this thing going. Huh. Nice. All right, hi everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to come and speak to you guys. I uh, did not have the opportunity to participate in Uber myself, but I've heard a lot about it both from some of my past classmates, uh, some of my now students, and I think you're in an awesome program. I hope you're enjoying it. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about optics and how that kind of plays into this paradigm of biology, healthcare, and that sort of thing. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, it's um, work that's very interdisciplinary, so it involves things like engineering, uh, math, biology, of course. And I would say that probably of those topics, biology is what I'm least of an expert in. So you guys may even be able to uh, teach me a few things. Um, just. Reiterating a little bit of what uh, Jennifer said, a little bit about me, I grew up about 30 minutes north of here at Oro Valley, so if any of you guys are from Tucson, that's uh, relatively close. I went to U of A for my undergrad and PhD, um, currently leading a lab in biomedical imaging. Uh, I also teach courses in engineering, health sciences, and I'm really, really uh, interested in promoting science outreach. I go to high schools, I teach uh, things about physics and optics to um, college, or excuse me, incoming college students and that sort of thing. I love really getting the word out there about how cool science is, and specifically optics. And so uh, I spend a lot of my time doing that. But why biomedical imaging for me? I'll give a little bit more of an in-depth uh, in description of why I decided to pursue this path. Uh, what is this, 11 years now, 12, 2012? So 11 years ago, I was diagnosed with leukemia, and uh, obviously not something you want to hear when you're 20 years old and just 19 at that point. But it really made me kind of change perspective and decide that I wanted to pursue something that could impact people. Up to that point, I was interested in science, but mostly things like astronomy, physics, that type of thing. And I really wanted to pursue something where I could make an impact. And so uh, I originally got my interest in biomedical optics from that point. Uh, optics specifically, just because there was overlap with some of those previous interests of astronomy and whatnot. But I realized I needed to learn how to do something before I could do something, and so I just went to get my degree, uh, bachelor's in optical sciences. I didn't really do a whole lot of biomedical up to that point, I mostly did things uh, in the context of um, uh, art, actually. I would go and take images and paintings 
So I uh, toured a lot through Europe, spent a lot of time in the Netherlands and Germany doing that, so that was pretty fun. Uh, after that, as Jennifer said, I went to uh, Cambridge, and here's where I started doing biomedical imaging. The uh, lab that I worked in um, was focused on esophageal cancer screening, so I, I did some of that. I uh, came back to do um, my PhD here, and you, you get masters along the way, so uh, I essentially focused in this case on ovarian cancer screening, so still cancer screening. Um, 2019, I, I decided to do a, a broad research experience in Korea. That was pretty cool, but then COVID happened, so I came back early. Thought that was a great time to finish up my dissertation, so I wrapped up, graduated about two years ago, and um, had a unique opportunity to start my life here and keep pursuing my passions and trying to uh, encourage others to do the same. And so that's where we're at right now. Now, getting a little bit more into what optics is and why it might be interesting to people pursuing biology related research. You can understand a lot about the body by looking at how light interacts with it. And so when we talk about light, we might refer to the spectrum that essentially refers to the colors of light from violet to red. And at different points in the spectrum, you can glean different types of information. For example, near the lower end, kind of the blue, you can get information about structure, so extracellular matrix, cellular structure, that type of thing. Um, and that can be very informative when you're looking at things like cancer or disease, because as you see tissue go from healthy to maybe early, early disease to late disease, you see it gets disrupted, the extracellular matrix gets really thick, things get all messed up. And so you can actually measure this using wavelengths down that lower end of the spectrum. And so uh, one piece of information you can glean is essentially about the structure. Up in the uh, higher end of the spectrum, uh, this is more in the red, and so as you might imagine, you can probe things related to blood. And so things that we might care about are how much blood there is and how oxygenated it is. And so again, with cancer, what you see, um, actually generally with any disease or wound, you see that there's generation of new blood vessels, it's called angiogenesis, and you watch these blood vessels grow more and more, because you need to bring more and more blood to sustain, in this case, the growing tumor. And so what you also see is that as that tumor gets bigger and bigger, the center of it is further and further away from those blood vessels, so the actual amount of oxygen it's getting goes down. And so these two uh, parameters are really important for trying to measure where a tumor is and how uh, progressive it is, and so we can measure that uh, using, for example, red light. Um, so that might, you say, is related to metabolism. And then sort of in the middle, uh, you get a lot of different signatures from things like proteins and amino acids. As you'll learn in the biology classes if you haven't already, we have a bunch of different proteins and amino acids. These will get upregulated or downregulated depending on what, um, what you're dealing with. But in the end, you can measure these signatures using optics and um, really get a good picture of, for example, biochemistry. And so this is a general kind of 10,000 foot view of how we can use optics to learn about biology. Uh, more specifically, there's a number of different technologies that look at individual characteristics of the tissue. And so this figure I'm showing up here is fairly complicated. I'm not going through all of this today, but suffice to say that there's different technologies. Each of these targets one of those different parameters, for example, angiogenesis, or thickening of the extracellular matrix. And you can tune your technology to target that specifically. And so of course, if you're trying to do biomedical imaging and approve something like cancer screening, you need to know what happens with the onset of cancer. What are the changes in biology, the biochemistry and structure? And so really, it's inexplicably uh, intertwined. The engineering, the biology, and the actual clinical practice. You need to know how they treat these things and how they, uh, how they manage them. So as Jennifer said, interdisciplinary is really um, the word to describe this. And so today, I'm mostly going to be talking about one specific application of optics in biomedical imaging, and it's related to uh, this parameter, or rather this property, fluorescence. So we've probably heard about fluorescence before. We may have observed it. For example, glow sticks are sort of fluorescent. They're actually phosphorescent, but it's close enough. The idea being that you have some molecule where you give it energy. In this case, we're giving it light. Over time, it will then give energy off again. And so here again, it gives off light, but it's at a different color. So depending on what that molecule is, it'll be giving you uh, this different conversion of one color to another. Now in terms of fluorescence, you can either have stuff which is natural in your body, like your cells will produce fluorescence, but you can also inject some kind of uh, what's called a contrast agent into the body, and that then is targeted to a certain marker that goes and binds to it, and then that will fluoresce itself. And so there's two types of fluorescence, and I'll talk about both of them. And so generally speaking, my lab is focused on uh, different applications of biomedical imaging. 
in uh, healthcare. Uh, we're definitely interested in cancer, but we also do some stuff with brain imaging. And so you can categorize this however you want, but usually uh, I like to think of it as application driven, and so things like cancer screening or surgical localization. Uh, engineering driven, so we do imaging device development. Of course, you want to develop the actual technology that clinicians might use. Uh, but then ultimately, you get a bunch of data from these images, and so you also need to think about how is it that you're analyzing it and extracting meaningful information. So these are all different topics that we explore, but as I said, today I'm going to be focusing on one specific application. And uh, so now we'll talk a bit about what that application is and what are the features of it that we care about. And so it is quite a mouthful, but it is uh, known as gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine So I might just call them NETs for the purpose of this, uh, this talk. It's a bit easier than, than what I just said. But the idea is gastroenteropancreatic. That means GI tract, so small intestine, colon, or the pancreas. Neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine is just a specific cell type, so that's kind of where that comes from. Uh, but the main idea is that these aren't a uh, very well understood disease. They've been growing quite a bit recently. For example, in the last two decades, we've seen an increase in about seven, by about seven fold, so that's significant. Uh, and generally, diagnosing these is not particularly challenging. You can see them just fine on MRI or a PET scan. You can even just measure blood and see if there are hormones that are, that are being overproduced. The tricky part is uh, removing them. And so here, surgery to remove these uh, tumors is is pretty bad. It takes, you know, maybe a uh, 30% chance that you will, um, that you'll have it fully removed, but there's a 10% chance that you'll just die associated with the complications from the surgery. And so that's, uh, if you want to read into it, it's called the Whipple procedure, but it's extremely invasive. And they essentially take out your whole pancreas, half your stomach, part of your small intestine, kind of stick everything back together. It's pretty bad. So if we could, for example, remove these locally, meaning just the tumor, not everything else, that would greatly improve uh, the quality of life. And so that's kind of what we're looking at here, is not diagnosing these tumors, but can we localize them specifically so you can only remove a little bit of tissue. And so given these problems with the surgery and there being a high mortality rate, some physicians will just say, oh, we're just going to wait and see. I'm not even going to risk doing surgery. So ideally, we could have some kind of minimally invasive approach to this, where you can uh, remove the tumor without doing too much um, extra. And so um, just a couple more statistics. This is where this 30% thing came from. If you miss any of the tumors, so incomplete removal, uh, you only have a 30% chance of surviving five years, so you obviously need to get the whole tumor out, uh, but you don't want to take too much. Um, if you do get the whole tumor, you have over nine in 10 chance of surviving, that's great. Um, but standard techniques, um, which uh, we call endoscopic ultrasound, so you have an ultrasound probe that you can fit into an endoscope, and palpation that's literally just feeling the tissue and seeing where it's stick. It's not particularly good at finding the cancer. It's only 50% sensitive, meaning uh, half the time you'll miss it. So really what we're trying to do is improve our ability to localize these tumors. Uh, an added challenge with these things is that uh, they're quite diffuse, meaning that they spread out. They're not just one primary localized tumor. Uh, and so you get what is called positive margins. And so that is where you have some incomplete resection, you scoop out some tissue, there's a little bit left over, which is uh, cancerous. And so we call that a positive margin. Um, the number one determinative outcome for any cancer surgery is whether you have positive margins or not. And so this is very important. You not only need to know if you've found a tumor, but if you've taken it all out. And so there's this kind of two-pronged uh, problem going on. And so many of these are diffuse or multifocal, so they're, they're all over the place. Um, as a result, you might miss some and they may metastasize later, meaning it spreads elsewhere. And um, typically, if you have metastasis, you have a very, very poor prognosis. And so there really are no existing techniques for margin definition in determining whether you have positive margins or not. You get it out, you hope for the best, and um, you see what happens. And so tumor localization is number one. Margin definition is number two. Those are the two big problems that we're dealing with in this case. And so what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to develop some kind of technology using optical imaging to help bridge this gap. And so ideally, it would be some kind of minimally invasive technology, and so we would call that a laparoscope. So it's essentially when you can uh, inflate the patient's abdomen with some CO2, and then make a small incision and insert a uh, device through that small incision as opposed to doing a full open abdominal surgery. I actually had a laparoscopic uh, surgery. It was to take my appendix out. And so I have three little scars on my stomach. But um, I was leaving the hospital on my feet the next day, so it was pretty chill. I think that um, much better than getting your entire stomach opened up. So how are we going to do this? We have two different goals here. 
And um, as I said before, understanding kind of the problem, the constraints, that's really important for designing a technology to meet them. And so here we have tumor localization and margin definition. So first we'll talk about localization. That's the case where you have a wide area and you need to know where to look. So fluorescence labeling is a tried and true technique for doing this across biomedicine. The idea being that you can have some molecule which binds to a certain receptor or a certain marker. Ideally, that would be overexpressed on your cancer or your disease, and then you can attach a fluorophore to it that fluoresces. And so essentially, you might have, um, let's say, folate. Oh, yeah, ovarian cancer. So I used this in my uh, PhD research. Folate receptor that's overexpressed on ovarian cancer. So you take a molecule that looks like folate, you take a green fluorescent protein, you stick it on it, then you put it in the environment where the tumor is, and it all just attaches to the tumor. Then you get these nice images where it lights up on the fluorescence, uh, right, uh, the fluorescence camera, where it's lighting up all the tumors green. So it works great for some diseases where you have specific receptors that you know to target. Um, other things you can use are just generally lighting up the vascular the vasculature. And so ICG, endocyanine uh, green, that's a molecule that they use that just goes through your bloodstream. So it lights up all of your vessels. Um, they use it for brain cancer, visualization, that sort of thing. So as I said earlier, fluorescence, you're basically just uh, exploiting this property of um, energy conversion between wavelengths. And so if you took your basic physics, you may uh, recognize some kind of diagram that looks like this where you have different energy states in a molecule. Uh, the idea here is that you promote the electrons in that molecule to higher energy states. Over time, you'll lose a little bit of energy just because that's how the universe works, and then it returns back to the ground energy state, and you have light coming off again, but it's a different color. So the way that this might work is that you shine blue light on something and you detect green light. It's pretty straightforward. In the case of uh, fluorescence, ag fluorescent agents, they typically work in the near infrared because tissue uh, absorbs light quite a bit in those visible wavelengths, and so you use near infrared so that you can see it a little bit better. And so for neuroendocrine tumors, where does this come in? Well, if we're trying to do a tumor-targeted fluorophore, we need to know what receptors are being overexpressed. And so conveniently, there is something called the somatostat receptor. Um, there are five types of them, and so in this case it's type 2, but it's expressed on over 80% of these tumors, and uh, it's an uh, extremely attractive target for doing this fluorophore labeled um, surgical guidance. And so the idea here is that you have cancer cells, you have a bunch of somatostatin receptors uh, sticking off of them, so you take a molecule that looks like somatostatin, you stick a fluorescent label on it, and then those ideally would fly in there, go into the receptor, and then light up where your tumor is. And so on the right here, these are just uh, what we would call uh, histology images, where you can essentially apply this method to a thin slice of tissue to get a nice uh, ground truth measurement of how well it expresses something. Uh, the idea here is that if it's brown, it's expressing some mass status receptor. So um, that's kind of the idea behind this, this approach, is that you can target these receptors. And so I am not a biochemist. I can't design contrast agents. And so I found some people in Texas who do this. And these uh, collaborators, um, I've worked with them to develop a near-infrared somatostat receptor contrast agent to bind to these neuroendocrine tumors. And so that's the Algerinia lab over at University of Texas Health Sciences Center. And the idea here is that they made this big molecule. Um, I don't quite understand the details, but they have their somatostat analog. That is the red part of the chemical structure. The uh, green is just something that connects the analog with the fluorophore, and then the blue is the fluorophore. And so they developed this, they tested it in things like cell culture and all that, showing that it's, it's quite, um, quite high affinity to binding to neuroendocrine tumor cells. We did some xenograft studies, so that's when you take a mouse, you inject tumor cells into it, and so we took tumor cells from a somatostat positive tumor, somatostat negative tumor, injected it, it grew, we then applied the contrast agent to the animal, and it uptook in the somatostat positive tumor, but not the negative one, so that's high specificity, meaning it doesn't label a bunch of random stuff. Um, and then we moved on to doing some human tissue studies, and so doing uh, with human tissue, you of course can't just go inject it into a person. So you typically start with tissues that are removed from surgery. You then work with the ex vivo tissue, we call it, where it's already been removed. You can apply the agent using different ways, and then measure it using your fluorescence camera. So that's what we're showing on, showing on the left, where we've had uh, patient two and three arbitrary numbers. They have neuroendocrine tumors. The top is essentially a photographic image, so it, it just looks like tissue. The bottom is a fluorescence image, and so you can see it's lighting up in red where the tumor is, uh, same with patient three, 
It seems like now it's like a new uh, new color. And then of course you always want to have a control case where you expect it not to light up. And so that's the normal patient here, patient five. And sure enough, there's they're not looking very bright. Um, they pursued some uh, additional work in, in animal models, uh, so that's shown up here on the right, basically just looking at, again, how well does it bind tumors uh, compared to other organs. The idea here is that you want to, again, localize to where the tumor is, but not too, too much anywhere else, because then you're still going to be taking out too much tissue, and especially in the case of these in the pancreas, uh, they tend to, um, uh, the pancreas is a very sensitive organ, so you don't want to take out too much. Now, this is all very promising, looks great for tumor localization, but if you remember, I said there were two things that we needed to worry about. Tumor localization, but then after you see it and take some of it out, is there anything left? It's a margin definition. And so one of the issues with fluores uh, fluorescence labeled imaging is that you do have some level of non-specific binding. So you can optimize all you want, but other tissues express some outside receptors that you do. Your liver expresses some of it. Your pancreas may express some of it. That type of thing. So in the end, your floor, your, your floor board doesn't know if this is a somatostat receptor on a tumor or a somatostat receptor on your liver. And so you get some residual fluorescence anyways, and you get this kind of dim background, where after you maybe take the primary tumor out, you just get this dim background of fluorescence, and you have no idea if that's tumor, if it's normal tissue. So that's where margin definition comes in. And so this idea of fluorescence uh, labeled imaging is great for tumor, tumor localization, but it only solves one half. Now, one inherent issue with this is that when you're dealing with these kind of um, scenarios, you have to consider what scale you're looking at. So in the case of surgery, you're looking at a pretty big scale. You're looking at the entire pancreas, maybe the liver of a patient. That's field of view on the order of inches. In the context of biology, that's pretty big. You know, cells are on the order of 10 microns. And so doing tumor localization, you do need to inspect the wide field of view. But when you're doing margin definition, you've now removed that large object. So you're looking at very small scale features. Something in optics is that you have this trade-off between resolution and field of view. If you have a high field of view, you can't have a high resolution. And so you essentially need to complement one technology with another that kind of fills in that gap. So that's the approach we're taking. Um, so the specific technology that we use, it's called multi-photon imaging, but it's essentially just a subset of fluorescence imaging. Here, though, we're leveraging the natural fluorescence of the body, not the uh, labeled fluorescence. And so with multi-photon, you can look at a standard fluorescence diagram where you have blue light illuminating, green light coming off. But what you're doing is you're trying to uh, illuminate with many, many photons at once, and so you actually absorb two of them, and that produces the energy transition. And so there, you can use two photons of red light. So you actually have lower energy light producing fluorescence and then the light that comes off is still, we can say, green. And so this is very counterintuitive if you just think of energy conservation, because you're illuminating with light which each photon has, we could say, an energy of five arbitrary units. But you're actually detecting light with an energy of 10. So you go from five to 10. You never have energy increase in the universe. You have to have energy loss. And so the point here is that you're absorbing two at once. And that has a lot of different advantages from a safety standpoint. For example, we don't want to burn tissue. and so. The higher the energy, the more dangerous it is. And so things like uh, lasers, you can get an uh, infrared laser FDA approved pretty easily, but you can't get a green laser FDA approved pretty easily, uh, specifically for this reason. And so multi-photon is great because it kind of lowers that translational barrier. Now, as I said, uh, this is not the same exact technology as I just talked about, because here we're trying to leverage those natural fluorophores. And so things in our body like tumor cells or normal cells or protein, those will fluoresce differently. And so you can leverage that information to try and understand what uh, they're actually composed of. Interestingly, with multi-photon image, there's a special event that happens as well, where instead of having this slight energy loss, which usually occurs with any fluorescence, you essentially have an instantaneous process where the light is scattered. And so you still have two photons to one photon, but the energy change is a little bit different. And so depending on what filters you use, you can essentially filter the light out just using looks like blue glass or green glass, you can separate this event from fluorescence. And so this event is exclusively produced by the uh, protein collagen in the body. And so it's a very important protein because it's essentially the connective tissue. It holds everything together. And so in the context of tumors, you have this extracellular matrix disruption, uh, you have collagen changing, you have the whole collagen network changing. So it gives you a really uh, interesting way in which you can visualize the tumor microarray. 
So you have second harmonic generation in the tissue autofluorescence. Autofluorescence is just that natural fluorescence that I measured. It's essentially tied to many different molecules and compounds. The ones that we care about might be related to, for example, cell metabolism. And so some things you'll learn about in the uh, cell respiration process of this whole NADH and FAD, those are related to cell metabolism, how much energy it's producing. Tumor cells can produce a lot more energy. Uh, porphyrin, for example, is related to blood, blood oxygenation, so we can visualize that using different uh, wavelengths of autofluorescence. And then there's an interesting compound called lipofusin, which is uh, related to this process called cell senescence. And so the cell kind of turns off for a while and then might turn back on later. Um, so all of these have been tied to cancer and they're very interesting targets in which you can try and visualize this natural fluorescence. And so some of the things that you might see in these images, uh, this is just of a simple scenario of a tendon. And so a tendon has lots of muscle, lots of collagen, so it's nice to kind of visualize. The red here is showing the uh, collagen network. And essentially what we did in this study was to um, investigate intense therapeutic ultrasound, but uh, we were visualizing the healing process. And so essentially we cut the tendon, and so it created a wound, and uh, the collagen essentially breaks up, and you have a bunch of immune cells that come in to help, uh, help repair it. And so all the green in this image B here is uh, immune cells, and all the red is collagen, and you can visualize it at a very high resolution. And so with multi-photon imaging, you can get on the order of one micron resolution. You can see individual cells. Um, so this is just a side-by-side -side showing kind of the standard image of tissue where you have the nice collagen network on the top, and then the bottom is showing kind of this clustering of cells coming to you. So multi-photon is great for visualizing these effects. Um, and what's cool with this too is that generally you can um, you can get a measure of depth in the tissue, and it just has to do with the actual process, but you can see that with standard fluorescence, you get light uh, getting produced by the whole cone being focused, whereas with multi-photon, you really only get a signal at the very precise focal point. And so it's useful because then you can move your sample up and down, and you get a nice depth map of, uh, of the tissue. And so ultimately, that was a little bit of an aside, but multi-photon imaging can measure these molecular biomarkers at the resolution equal to a pathologist, what the gold standard is for determining if something is diseased or if it's uh, healthy. And so you can measure these different parameters, FAD, lipofusin, NADH, and then that collagen network. And so we wanted to test whether this would be sufficient for doing margin definition in neuroendocrine tumors. And so you can use, I, I'll probably go over this quick because it's more of an optics-y thing, but um, essentially uh, we have facilities here to do multi-photon imaging. You can select your different wavelengths, and so here we're basically just picking different colors that correspond to the fluorescence of these different biomarkers that we care about. Uh, it then essentially will direct the light down to your sample. We use 15 patient samples of uh, neuroendocrine tumors from the duodenum. Um, light comes back into your system, and then you can select what to detect. And so again, you're kind of matching up this energy conversion from illumination to detection. That tells you what the floor for is. And so ultimately, we did this for all of our different uh, samples. Uh, we wanted to co-register it with standard pathological analysis to know exactly what we're looking at. Are we looking at a tumor? Are we looking at normal tissue? And furthermore, what type of tumor? How aggressive it is? You can um, use histology to measure these different things to see if we can get a prediction of that. Um, to actually go through the analysis, what we had to then do was go look at the image. And we have a pretty large image in this case of the tissue, and that includes things both of tumor, of normal surrounding tissue, for example, the stroma, and select that collagen network. And so we went through and we sub-selected the different regions which corresponded to these different tissue types. Um, there's also glandular structures there that are quite interesting and some people think are actually the precursor to the tumor. So we wanted to look at how well we could define the tumor versus all of these surrounding tissues. They all look different, they're all a bit, uh, bit unique in their own way, and so using our multi-photon imaging, can we perform margin definition? That's basically the idea here. And so looking at some, what some of these look like uh, kind of close up, these images um, that I'm showing kind of in the left column, um, and then the second column is zoomed into the little red box, the third column, again, big field of view, and then the uh, fourth column is zoomed into the little red box again. It's showing kind of at the cellular level how well you can differentiate between the two tissue types. And so, for example, in this left part, this is uh, the difference between two glands, the top and the bottom. Um, and you can't really tell any difference here, but that's okay because we're not looking at a tumor. We're just looking at two different types of glands. It's surrounded by that stroma, that collagen. 
So that's not necessarily for a margin definition, we're just trying to visualize cells, but on the right here is where we get the tumor kind of adjacent to a uh, relevant area. And so the tumor is on the right side. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, essentially it's this darker purple and pink area. And then you have this area on the left, which is a little bit whiter and clearer. That's where all the glands are. Uh, the top image here is, again, if a pathologist were to look at this, and so that's uh, you know, several days after the surgery, they can process the tissue, slice it up, and then take a look. Not very helpful for intraoperative action. Uh, the bottom here, this is showing what it would look like under multi-photon imaging. And so you see this massive uh, collagen kind of disruption happening, where it becomes this really, really thick web, um, and it begins to kind of invade into the uh, normal tissues. And so this was a metastatic tumor, and so it was already begun to invade and move elsewhere. And using this technique, you can visualize this in vivo, so at, at the point of care, not necessarily afterwards in the lab. And so it was very promising for uh, trying to visualize these. We did this over a large sample set, um, and some of our ongoing work too is applying this to other types, uh, pancreatic ones, and so we're doing quite a bit of that as well. Now in terms of analysis, I'm not going to get too much into that just because it's more uh, mathematical type of things, but the idea is that you want to create some kind of statistical model to say, what are the chances that our image can say that this is normal versus tumor? And so in your studies, you may come across these plots that, that look uh, essentially like um, a hill, that they kind of have a, or a diagonal line going up from the bottom left to the top right, and then they have this hill of lines that kind of go up. And ideally, if you have a perfect approach that will 100% of the time differentiate normal versus tumor and never be wrong, meaning that it never has a false positive, these lines will go straight from the bottom left, go straight up, and then straight to the right. So it looks like a square, basically. And so how close you get to that square is going to tell how good you are. Uh, it's, it's, again, a little bit um, academic in terms of the details, but the idea is that this is what many people in clinical research use to quantify how well you can differentiate between two things. Uh, in our case, uh, we do pretty well. Uh, you can see that it's not a perfect square, but it's uh, getting close to there. The idea being that it has high sensitivity, about 9%, so 9 out of 10 times we can correctly find the tumor tissue, and very high specificity, meaning that only, I think it's about 95%, but essentially 95% of the time, our uh, normal tissue is indeed normal tissue, and so it's only about a 5% miss rate as opposed to 50%, which is the standard of care. And so obviously this is a bit preliminary, and we still need to merge the two into one combined system, so we have tumor localization with fluorescence imaging, margin definition with multi-photon imaging, kind of targeting these two different paradigms. And so that's what we're moving toward right now, is that currently we're trying to do this simultaneously on human specimens of pancreatic and organ consumers. So we get a specimen that has the fluorophore label to it, and then we collect all this data at once. And so we've only just started this, so we only have about six patients, but the idea here is that if you're only using that tumor localization with somatic data, you don't do very well. You can see that this curve is, is kind of close to that diagonal. And diagonal is random. That's if you were to present it to a coin and flip the coin over and over and over, you're going to get the diagonal. With the somatostatin label, you don't do very well for margin definition because I said they have that non-specific binding. You might just be finding liver tissue or normal pancreas. But as you add the multi-photon, that line becomes more and more um, like the square. And so here with only six, six patients, it's not, not an excellent sample size, but we can get almost perfect recognition between normal and tumor tissue using this technology. Now, of course, this stuff is all great as preliminary studies, but where is that going? Well, you actually need to develop a device to collect this in a patient. And so we're working on building this uh, device. This is a laparoscope, as I said, something with a rigid tube that it's about uh, half an inch in diameter, so it's pretty small, but you can make a small incision, introduce it to the patient, and then visualize the surgical field as the surgeon is actually operating. And so essentially the idea here is that during operation, they can visualize exactly where the tumor is, but also afterward determine whether they still have something left over or if they've successfully resected everything. And so ultimately, uh, our goal here is to apply this technology to improve the ability to visualize and manage these tumors, uh, but it has broad applicability to other cancers as well. This idea of tumor targeting and margin definition is common among almost all cancers that you resect surgically. Not so much blood cancer, but something like uh, brain cancer or stomach cancer or esophageal cancer, that type of thing. So it's a very common paradigm, and this technology could be kind of broadened, could be 
optimized for other tumors as well. So that kind of wraps up the technical part. Um, just want to show my lab real quick. I think everyone is fantastic. Uh, I would be lost without them. And people like you, you're what makes research happen. You know, I think that obviously you have your mentor and your advisor, and they do an amazing job as well. But without you, this could not happen. We couldn't make the amazing advances that we are. And I really hope that you're enjoying the process and consider doing more in the future. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few pieces of advice for young scientists. Uh, I think that one of the things that I learned throughout um, my education so far was to keep your mind open to things that aren't necessarily standard. Like if you have the opportunity to study abroad or do some kind of internship in a topic that you've never heard of before. You might find it extremely interesting and something that almost changes your life in terms of what you want to pursue. Uh, in particular, I, I really appreciated my experiences abroad. I think that being exposed to different cultures, different ways of thinking, that type of thing I thought was very uh, foundational for me going forward. Um, I think it's uh, great to also keep in mind that networking is really important. I know that it's like a buzzword here all the time. I think networking doesn't have to be for the purposes of finding a job. You know, you don't have to go there and sell yourself and be like, oh yeah, I'm looking for X, Y, Z. Do you have something? But it's just sending out your feelers and understanding who's out there, talking to them, learning what they think is upcoming, and what they think might be interesting. Because that kind of gives you an idea of what might be on the horizon in the next five to 10 years. And so I thought that just chatting with people, I think is really informative, both in your labs, around whatever building you're in, at conferences, if you guys can go to conferences, that sort of thing. Even just go to the professor's office hours and talk to them. I think that that um, was very helpful for kind of me learning what's possible. Uh, what types of careers are out there, what I wanted to do, um, and that sort of thing. Regarding mentors, I think it's very important to get multiple mentors. Don't just have one person who you always go to for advice. I think that everyone is human, they're, they're flawed. You know, people might have one perspective that uh, is very different than what you might care about. And so having a nice variety of people that you can kind of go to and get advice from just get different opinions, I think is quite helpful. Uh, and then finally, don't let failure discourage you. I think that one thing that you probably have already noticed is that you only ever observe other people's successes. You only ever hear about when someone wins this or that, or when someone gets 100% on their test. You never hear about all the things that they failed, not even failed, but all the challenges that they encountered along the way. And so it's really just one step in that progression. And it's like, you know, Jennifer was saying, oh, we won the gold water game. I lost a lot more than I, you know, it's like I applied to so many different things and I just kept on applying, applying, applying. Some of them went through, some of them didn't, and it's all just part of the process. And so it's okay, of course, to be disappointed if something doesn't work out, but just keep in mind that when you hear about other people succeeding or getting some award, you don't know how many times they tried, you don't know how much uh, work they put into it. And so keep in mind that just because you know your whole story and you only, understand, you only see other people's highlight reel, don't let it get, just don't let it get you down because everyone has that whole story, you might just not be exposed to it. So. I think I definitely could have uh, benefited from acknowledging that earlier because I feel like, you know, especially in undergrad, you hear about all these other good things and you start feeling, oh, I'm not good enough or something like that. But, um, yeah, so that's it. Um, love to take any questions and, uh, yeah, thanks for the time. So certainly you guys are all super early, so I, you shouldn't have 10 mentors right now. Um, I, and I think 10 is too much anyways, you know, two or three good mentors is enough. Uh, I think that mentors can be different roles, they don't all have to be a research advisor. And so if you get along really well with one of your professors in class, and you just chat with them a lot in office hours, and it's not just about, oh, how do I do problem A or B, that's an easy way to kind of build up a relationship with someone who can give you uh, almost unbiased advice, because they're not necessarily invested in what you're currently working on. Um, I think if you end up doing more than one program, for example, let's say next summer you go do another internship or do a different research lab, that would be an amazing way to get another mentor as well. Um, 
I think kind of those are the two main ones that come to mind, but there's also uh, opportunities, for example, if you go to a conference or something, where you actually just go to these professional development, uh, professional development networking things, and they'll like pair you with a senior person in your field, and it's like they give you a mentor, basically. And it, it's in that case, it's a little harder to keep in touch, but now that we Zoom all the time anyways, you could just you know keep in touch every month, have a Zoom every couple of months, something like that. Um, they definitely don't all have to be super intimately involved with your progression as a person. I think uh, you know having one that is is fantastic, and then having others that are a little bit more removed is equally valuable. Yes. Or based on your research, rather than the yeah. Oh, good question. Yeah, that, um, so essentially that, that was kind of this, the second one. That in, in a case of like, if you have a single sample, you, uh, we would divide it up into like a grid and be like, okay, is this tumor, is this normal, is this tumor, is this normal, is this tumor, is this normal? That's what a pathologist would do anyways. And so in that case, 95% of those grid items were correct. If you actually took a step back though, it's not 95% per patient. Usually we would have 100% for any given patient, and then there's a few patients where it just totally failed. And these tumors in particular are extremely heterogeneous. They're really weird sometimes, which gave rise to those disparities and why sometimes it worked really well and other times it didn't. But the 95 was averaged over everyone. Does that make sense? Yep. Another question? No. Yes. Um, uh, That's a great question. So the goal here with making a device that could be used intraoperatively is that they can do it during the surgery. So you don't have to go back. Uh, currently what has to happen is that they go in, they remove something, and then they look at what they removed. They don't actually look at what's left over. And if they find that the edges of what they removed are still tumor, then they say, oh, we missed some. But for example, if you have these multifocal, where there's a tumor over here and here, you're not gonna know about that second one. And so theoretically you may result in another surgery anyways, but we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to do it such that you can remove something, look right away, and then if you need to take more, you just do it right there. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry. Question. Last no. question. Uh, yeah. Sorry. How, how long does imaging actually take? Like, what would that what would that look like? Yeah. Great question. So the fluorescence uh, the first one is super fast. It's like okay. video rate. You can just yeah. see it right away. The second one takes a while, and that's okay. because you need to scan over the image pixel by pixel. Um, so the, the images I was showing are quite large, and so those took many, many minutes to take. In this device, it would be designed such that it would be on the order of like a couple seconds. Okay. And so it's, it's a design parameter. Um, the lab kind of studies, you know, they take a long time, but uh, the idea is that the technology would be such that it's uh, kind of video rate. Okay, very cool. Wonderful. Thank you again, appreciate it. Yeah, of course.